Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much again for uh, joining this VWO webinar. Uh, I hope you and your family are uh, safe inside your respective homes and I wish you all good health. Uh, although a lot of uh, regions did see a uh, number falling, but many regions are seeing uh, a second wave. So that's very, very unfortunate. So please stay inside your homes and uh, respect every, I mean, uh, protect everyone around you. Uh, so yes, my name is Vipul and I'm the marketing manager at VWO. I am the moderator for today. Uh, for those who are hearing about VWO for the first time, uh, VWO helps you identify leaks in your uh, conversion funnel and provides tools to fix those leaks and keep your revenue growing. Uh, with me alongside you can see is David, who is the founder of Future Conversion. Hey, hi David, how's it going? Yeah, not bad, buddy. How are you? Doing absolutely fine. Great. So before I, uh, you know, uh, switch off my camera and switch off my mic and let David start off his presentation, I just request all of you to ask any questions that you might have during the course of this presentation. Just send it to us or using the questions panel on the GoToWebinar and uh, we'll definitely take them up. And also, yes, since I've seen uh, David's presentation, I know that it's very, very of fun and filled with insights. So stay attentive and take notes. Over to you, David. Cool. Creativity and experimentation is a topic that's like really close to my heart. But as any narcissistic presentation should start, I'm going to start by talking about me. Um, this is my timeline. Here I am, little cutie pie. I was actually born in 1987. I'm not 35, as this timeline suggests. When I was younger, I always wanted to be, for my sins, a, a Disney animator. You know, the craft, the precision, the creativity. You used to draw on what were known as animated cells. You had a foreground and a background. And I visited Disney every year. I've been uh, an embarrassing 33 times to Disney World in Orlando. In 1995, Toy Story came out and ruined my life. Uh, I remember my dad saying, you don't want to work with those cells. Everything's going digital nowadays. And I remember crying and I didn't want to work in digital. I, I wanted to be an animator. I wanted to express my creativity. I don't really know what happened between 95 and 2015. It was mostly beer or university. But despite not wanting to work digital in 1995, fast forward to 2015 and I own a digital agency. Uh, <laughs> Uh, fast forward another five years and you know we 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 create uh, fabulous conversion strategies for the likes of Brewdog and Travis Perkins and Sports Direct. Um, those conversion optimization strategies are ones that I'm I'm really proud of. And naturally, we do a lot of A/B tests. And whilst I don't get to do any hand-drawn animations, you know that creative streak is kind of always stuck within me. So that's like a reason why I feel like I'm semi-qualified to talk about this. But I'm gonna go back to my love. I'm gonna go back to Disney. I'm gonna let you guys know a little bit of a story. It'll only take five minutes, I promise. So in 2000s, Disney was, I'm gonna say, starting to lose their creativity. They had a series of theme parks. She had the occasional new rides, but innovation was limited to Imagineers who were isolated in a process of, of just ride design. They had a series of copycat theme parks in you know, Tokyo and Hong Kong came out in that era and some massive flops. I don't know if you guys know, they, they created a, a, the Lion King one and a half, the Akuna Matata, huge flop, this slew of sequels that just didn't work. And the parks themselves, they had a lot of problems. As you can see, Mr. Mike Wazowski over here losing his arm. You know, maps were like broadsheets, children being lost on a day-to-day -day basis. But the biggest problem, bar none, was one of data. Personal computers on the rise, you know, the iPhone came out in 2007-ish. Data was, was everywhere and everything. But, but Disney had none of this. They had nothing but anecdotal data about what their users were doing in their parks. You know, you go in the park and there's a black box. What, what were the guests actually doing? And to Meg Crofton. Meg Crofton was the then president of Walt Disney World Resort. And she instructed a task force of five people and no, not Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, Pluto, and Donald. Uh, they're actually Imagineers. And the task was, look for pain points. What are the barriers to getting into the experience faster? 
And they came back with things like, you know, a theme park without turnstiles or rides without queues, but they found like one thing implemented over here would have a domino effect all the way over here. How can a team of five root out all the problems within a series of five theme parks? Well, it turns out that there is inspiration everywhere. And traveling between Disneyland in California and Disney World in Orlando, the team found inspiration in one thing. You know those, I'm going to say awful, I'm sorry if anyone does work for Sky Mall, I hope not, but the, the Sky Mall magazines, you know, in front of every passenger seat, you look through them, you go straight to the gadgets and you never end up buying anything. Well, the Fab Five drew particular inspiration from a wearable device in Sky Mall Mag, known as the Tri Z Magnetic Band, which at the time was designed to improve your golf swing. And it was for golf purposes. They also had the Nike Plus Sport Band. And they thought, what? What if Disney did something like that? What if a band could be the key that unlocked everything at Disney World? And so it began. Hey presto, this band known as the Magic Band, it literally unlocked everything in your hotel room. Yeah, sorry, it unlocks your hotel room. You can enter your credit card details on it so you don't have to carry your bumpy wallet in the park. You can enter your fast passes on it to skip queues. And what happens when you skip queues? You know, overall use of the park goes up, people spend less time in line, they're doing more, they're spending more. Can you imagine a scenario where you tapped onto a ride and it broke down? Disney noted that you had a negative experience, so they triangulated your position and sent Mickey and Minnie to find you and uh, kind of make up your day, if only. Uh, <laughs> um, so like behavioral data is now available. Um, and what an incredible tale of creativity. You know, removing ourselves from the day-to-day, -day, homogenization theme parks, jumping on a plane, taking inspiration from another product and applying it to your own. Now that was all the way back in 2013. Unfortunately, <laughs> I feel when it comes to A-B testing, I think we could take a lot of learnings from that to what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the problem of creativity with an A-B testing and what to do about it. Guys, it needs to improve. Come on. We're all creative. We're all human beings. We can genuinely do this. So I have, I have a hypothesis, naturally, being in experimentation. But unfortunately, I can't statistically prove it. So, I don't know, this is an assumption, it's a belief. We start with best practices, and pardon my French, shite case studies. These are the standard. You know, they're widely published and they're well known. Sticky filter here, colored call to actions there. Goodness me. Those case studies and best practices are limited, often to either a solution that doesn't necessarily tackle a problem, or they're purely focused on usability and they're rarely focused on actually changing the user journey or behavior. Because these case studies have results attached to them, they're often seen as quick wins, which means everyone copies them, and over time, these solutions become the norm, they're expected. They do not, nor will they not, impact the journey. So that's my hypothesis, and let's, let's go through that one by one. Who remembers which test one? It was a slew of case studies, where you selected what you thought was the winner and it would show you the results. You know, is the blue button the winner or is the orange button the winner? Goodness me. Those case studies were often, as you can see, like really basic. Um, dare I say, optimizely, uh, there'll be a foghorn going somewhere being on a VWO webinar, but dare I say the word optimizely. They're the ones that actually started off testing on the Obama campaign, testing button colors, CTA copy, images, headlines what we would consider to be very basic now. I think since Trump came in, they've since stopped using that case study. Um, these types of case studies are what we would consider, they're what we consider as best practice or you know, standard. And here's the thing, those case studies, those best practices, they're limited to usability changes. And what do I mean by that? So at user conversion, we categorize our experiments into three classifications usability, anxiety, and motivation. Usability is making an action easier to achieve, like removing navigation links within a checkout to create a closed checkout. Anxiety is what prevents a user from taking an action, like adding trust logos to reduce the anxiety of payment concerns. 
motivation is what persuades users to take an action. So psychological techniques like scarcity or urgency to push users through a checkout process. On average, a motivational uh, experiment is 103 times more impactful than a usability change, and anxiety a 34 uh, times more impactful. We know this because we've classified uh, 789 experiments and we, we, we found those statistics. So in short, usability changes do not change a user behavior. They just make it easier. And yet we all, as optimizers, you know, often test usability-based changes. Thank you, Obama campaign. And these ideas are copied ruthlessly. If I said to you guys, look, we, we, we've got a problem. Our users reach I don't know, halfway down our product page and they don't know where the add to bag button is. What would you do? I guarantee the vast majority of you would say, sticky add to cart button. <laughs> you know, we're conditioned, like subconsciously granted, to reply with those types of answers because we've seen it being used before or we've read that it's worked before. Are you guys aware of like innocent drinks? So they're run by Coca Cola now and they sold out. But they're known for being pretty like novel in their execution of copy and tone. You know, they're quite familiar, quite cheeky, colloquial, and so much so that this this like tone it became standardised and to consumers often expected. Uh, the creator of this tone is a is a chap called Paul Burke. If you if you Google him, he talks about his story. He actually regrets how this has taken off. How Burger King are copying this tone unnecessarily. Because of this copying, our users are becoming more and more desensitized, meaning our solutions lack impact. This is our attempt to try and add a method behind the madness. I believe that our users are becoming more desensitized. I believe that our solutions do lack impact because they are copied. And here are, here are two usability experiments we've run over a series of four years, from 2015 to 2019, uh, over different websites. So naturally users are going to react differently to different stimulus but it's a closed checkout and a, a usp varta promote certain unique benefits and whilst not statistically significant because it's the same test run over different sites we can see a pattern of behavior you know the impact of each experiment decreases over time in 2015 when we ran a closed checkout test we would see north of like 10 percent uplift easy now we'd be lucky for three four or anything. So, where case studies are rooted and promoted in generic basic executions, they are often copied from one site to the next. They therefore are becoming more, or users are becoming more and more desensitized to them. Let's get into the juicy stuff. What can we do about this hypothesis, if it may or may not be true? I'm going to start with some examples. I'm going to say get creative. I've got five tips on how we can be more creative with our experiments later, but I wanted to highlight some experiments that we've done for our, some of our clients first. So the client, Biscuiteers. They sell gorgeous biscuits as a gift for your loved one. The problem they found is that users often struggle to find a perfect product as a gift. They became overwhelmed. You know, they'll, they'll go down the, the listing page, you're like, oh, I like that. Oh, that, that's nice. Yes, like, oh, that's lovely, etc. So a typical route to solve that would be product recs, effective merchandising, something like that. What we did, we actually interviewed their staff and asked them, hey, D David, you work in manufacturing. What's, what's your favorite biscuit and why? We created an emotional connection to a product by linking team members' favorite biscuits to the user and we, we, we promoted that. You know, we used it as a delighter. Hey, well done, you've stumbled across David's favorite biscuit. So we actually, we actually stole the idea from, uh, you know, when you go to cinemas and you go to View, for example, uh, or Odeon, don't know if they're still about now, uh, but it'll say, hi, I'm David, you know, my favorite film is Avatar. Um, yeah, yeah, some, something along those lines. Uh, we saw a 16% increase in ad to bag for like for like products. And it was actually such a big learning for the team at Biscuiteers. They create little stickers of those favorites and they, uh, they replicate them in store, which is quite sweet. What about Travis Perkins? What do you do when users struggle to find products 
because of the over categorization of 24,000 products in over 600 categories. You know, if, like 40% of users reaching a product, uh, sorry, less than 40% of users reach a product when they use the navigation, and is even worse on mobile. You know, you could prioritize search, try and push users to search. You could redesign the whole entire navigation. Goodness no. So we actually took inspiration from the the Argos catalog. You know, those huge heavy books that give you a hernia when you flip from right to the back of them because you're looking for the index, you're looking for the A to Z. So we did that. You know, when there are so many products available in so many different categories, why not create an A to Z of all those products? Follow the phone book example. It's an oldie, but a goodie. Uh, for this, we saw an increase in baseline conversion, baseline of 26%. Interestingly, 40% of all users use the A to Z nav as opposed to the menu. It's, very, it's funny, isn't it? You know, we get stuck in this structure of uh, arbitrarily trying to find products and linking them back to categories. Um, like in Travis Perkins, if you want to find decking, you like decking. What's, what's decking under? Outdoor, maybe? Garden? Outdoor, garden, tim timber? Tim decking, timber? Wood? You know, it, like you work backwards in your brain. Uh, so an A to Z worked really well for them. Want another? Um, okay, go to any e-commerce website, add a product to basket. What do you see? A notification to tell you that you've added to the basket. Well done. Now what do you do? You click back. <laughs> Why? Because you guarantee that the one product that you're not going to add to the basket is the one that the website has left you on after adding it to your basket. Right? So showcasing users recommended products related to that product that they're on, as well as similar categories, it's, it's really important. So here, the flannels, you know, we saw 43% increase in users viewing another PLP or a PDP. Um, what, was, what was interesting for this is that whilst we may have been getting more users to products, they weren't necessarily the right products. So then the learning from that was one about personalizing products, for example, within this scenario. I could go on and on, but I, I kind of urge us to all challenge the the status quo, I mean, take a navigation or a menu structure, especially on mobile. It's mostly considered as, as a structure, okay, nothing more. And a few people think of it as more. But when we're asking our users to cognitively, cognitively, cognitively associate a product to a category, you know, in the Deccan example I just gave for Travis Perkins, like, it's really hard work. <laughs> you're, it's just a guessing game. I call it the like a babushka doll of guessing games because you're like, what's behind door number one? What's behind door number two? Etc. So what is, let's take it back, what is the purpose of a navigation menu? It's to aid product discovery. What about adding, you know, recently viewed products, for example, in the nav? Uh, what about adding recently viewed categories? or best selling products. It completely depends on your business and the product. But challenge the navigation. One of my um, one of my favorite articles is by it's a really geeky article. Um, but shout out to the Baymard Institute. And this is ages ago. When was this? Uh, I don't know. It was a long time ago. And they did a usability study on breadcrumbs. Challenge breadcrumbs. You know, this article basically said you need two different types of breadcrumbs. You need those that are structural and those that are contextual. So let's say I'm on you know, Sports Direct and I search for tents and I go to a search result page and then I go to a product and it's a, it's a pretty cool tent. That product will have breadcrumbs of something similar like outdoor camping. But the breadcrumb demonstrates that structural perspective of where the tent is, but it's not where the user came from. The user came from search results. So generally what you find is that users just click back a lot. It was a pretty crappy journey, you know, trying to trying to always click back. So why don't we create breadcrumbs that say, would you like to go back to the search results? We actually did this for a client and we saw an interaction rate of around 9%. For me, that demonstrated the intent that the users wanted that type of feature for reference. So I'm going to go into a few more examples, but it, you know, I almost want to talk about like how do we all do this? Because some of it's relatively simple, others it's more cultural. 
I don't want to get too theoretical about everything, but there are five C's. I've created these five C's, and yes, I, it's six if you include culture. And yes, I, I did look up like cinnamons to try and all make sure that all the words started with a C, and it worked. <laughs> so the first three are cultural. So you've got uh, conditions, conflict, and collaborate. And the next two are more practical, copy and continually iterate. That one was a bit of a dodgy one. I think it starts with a C. Um, let's dive into it anyways. So these are the, these are the C's. <laughs> these, are the, uh, these are the principles of um, what I would consider to be creativity, at least within experimentation or solution design. So needless to say, if you work in an environment that's not creative, output can be can be pretty limited. You know, exercise, meditate, ensure your physical space is stimulating, yada, yada, yada. They're, they're really good. But conditions are more than physical. And one of, one of the hypotheses I have, I was actually chatting to a friend about this, um, a guy called Max Hawkinson, worked for a great agency called Bind. Um, we're actually writing a white paper on, on creativity. Um, please shout me up if you're interested in reading about that. But uh, we have a belief that the current conditions and demand of trade and working in sprints with trade pressures it equates to reduce risk, meaning a, a default to creating solutions of those that we know or those that we're conditioned to. You know, trade demand results yesterday, CEOs are under pressure, econ product managers, they move away from risk, more toward comfort factors. The environment that we see businesses in often is a place where risk is avoided and an immediate action is demanded. You know, walk fast, make it happen, ship it, do it yesterday, and all of this. So conditions are really important. Conflict. Um, I really recommend reading a book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. And he talks about a pyramid of the factors that constitute a successful team. Those are trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and inattention to results. I won't go into all of this, but trust is required as the foundation. But the fear of conflict is the fear to speak up, to contribute, to bounce off, and therefore the fear of, I would say, creativity. The most creative solutions don't come from a single source. They come from multiple sources. This is the one that, you know, me personally, I struggle with conflict quite a lot because um, conflict often is associated with, I suppose, confidence, uh, specifically like confidence in knowledge and in yourself. So this is a difficult one to get right, for me anyways. Collaboration. So. Collaboration is obviously the most important. You know, we set up user conversion as a multidisciplinary team set because we actually thought that that was the most creative way to execute a campaign or a strategy is to get different different people in the room together. And it's a theory that's shared by all, right? Oh, sorry, not by all, by some, by most. Uh, this theory of T-shaped marketers joining together to create a Tetris roadmap. There's a story of Elon Musk and the reason why he's such a smart chap is because he read hundreds of books when he was a kid on all different top topics from rocket science to, to politics to whatever. But what was really interesting, um, in the 1990s there was a psychologist, a guy called Kevin Dunbar. He began conducting research on, well, researchers. <laughs> he uh, set up cameras in like um, biology labs and he recorded as much as what he could yada 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 he also did some interviews and, and stuff with researchers and his most striking discovery had to do with the physical location of where the most innovative breakthroughs for biological discoveries happened turns out ground zero of innovation wasn't the microscope it was at the conference table it was at the water cooler and um, water cooler is such an american term um the water thing <laughs> the water cooler um where you know people will gather basically and discuss their work so i i think collaboration is really important and you know we we do that at uc we work in sprints with our clients 
And when it comes to collaboration and conflicts and environments radiate creative practices, we can really create some beautiful work together. So let, let's go through this as an example. So this is this is flannels again. Let me ask you guys a question. What is what is the purpose of filters? Why do they exist? Why do users use them? I'm about to say something really contentious. I'm, I'm so sorry, but the, the amount of e-commerce businesses that we speak to, and they all roughly say the same thing, which is our filters are crap, we need to fix them. And when we actually demonstrate how many people actually use filters, it's, it's very, very minimal. Uh, but often the solutions are one of trying to increase filter usage. So sticky filters. Uh, me and my director Ryan, we always we always take a bit because sticky filters seems to be like such a such a poignant, like very atypical uh, experiment. But we need to understand the behaviour. Like why did it exist? So with flannels, we ran a series of collaborative sprints where we presented evidence to uh, to the to the team. We found that it was actually really high. 25% of all users use filters um, on the listing page and uh, differed from mobile to desktop. And different attributes were used on different categories, etc. The most important finding was the why. Why do users use filters on flannels? And for flannels, due to the abundance of products available, it was choice. It was, I want to narrow down my choice. And for reference, that's not the only reason why users use filters in general on different sites, you know, their purpose changes. But we created a solution by reaffirming the number of products that were available, like 415 in that screenshot. We were able to almost add anxiety to users. Hey guys, you've only viewed 21 products out of 415. You might want to give filter in a little try. And it did work, you know. Filter usage increased by 15%, but more importantly, add to bag increase after filter usage, i.e. suggesting quality above quantity. But we didn't stop there, and nor should you. You know, this is about iteration as well. So we mixed that, that knowledge of, um, of the number of products with attributes. So we know what attributes work best, and we know what's most used on what categories. So for example, coats and jackets, you know, it's, it's brand for sale, it's price, etc. Remember how I said before, I think I said it, uh, generic ideas will yield generic results. I didn't say it, I said it now. Generic ideas will yield generic results. And it's time to personalise user behaviour to cohorted user problems. So given that we know brand attribute on coats and jackets, Highlighted filters in the product grid increase use, usage of filters by, by X. We thought we would pop that brand filter, put it in the product grid. Hey presto, 9% more users selected brand attribute. Well, you, you kind of expect that. You know, it's about prominence uh, as well. But we did see a 5% increase in conversion post engagement. And then what do you do from there? Well, Personalize those top brands that you see to the affinity of that user. If I'm a user and I'm interested in Hugo Boss, Dolce & Gabbana and Off-White, highlight that. You know, I might not be interested in Gucci or, or Stone Island. Or merge the two ideas together. You are 21 products into 500 city. Why not filter by brand? Et cetera, et cetera. So I think collaboration is really important to talk to one another because that's where the best ideas come from. Conflict allows you to push those boundaries and even that status quo and the conditions of which you work in, these are usually cultural, you know, allow you to practice those types of things. There are two more C's, remember there are five in total. So one is copy. This is actually probably one of my favorites. So what, I don't know if you guys know this, um, I didn't until I read it about five days ago, but what was the original inspiration behind GPS? It was Sputnik. It's a really good story, actually. So accidentally, apparently, a few months after Sputnik launch, US scientists were able to deter the, the position of Sputnik from a frequency. The Department of Defense then said, hey, I wonder what if we could flip this and turn an unknown location on the ground from a known location above it to triangulate where, say, 
oh, I don't know, nuclear submarines are? Uh, and that, that's GPS. So GPS was actually born from Sputnik. It's a really nice example of taking something, in this case, a satellite, I think Sputnik was a satellite, um, and applying it to their industry, in this case, defence, military, and then copying that even further for the purpose of recreational activities like, you know, like driving or, or watches or whatever it might be. And so this is a, an example of the Travis Perkins aid set nav that I showed you earlier. Let's go through a couple of these. Let's let's try and push push those boundaries. Why don't we copy Netflix browsing UI for e-commerce websites or browsing products? You know, it's well known. Netflix have tested it. Users just scrolling in one way. I completely appreciate that you end up going on Netflix and you end up not watching anything. But I wonder if that browsing UI is there for a reason. Uh, why don't e-commerce sites replicate it? What about Tinder's concept of swiping through stuff that we like or that we don't like? I like that t-shirt, I like that t-shirt, I don't like that t-shirt, I like that t-shirt. Or Medium's concept of continually browsing from one article to another. As you scroll down to increase dwell time, you know, you'll, you'll read an article in Medium and it just very naturally blends into the next article. Imagine that on a product page where you see this scroll from one product to the next or a PLP, a category. So I realise that uh, I speak a lot about e-commerce websites. The majority of our clients are e-com. It's quite natural for me. Um, where was I? Uh, using using no notifications as a form of like social shopping. I wasn't going to put this in after watching The Social Dilemma, um, but I did. You know, copying the likes of Facebook or Twitter informing users, you know, hey, a new product has been added uh, whilst you were browsing, or I don't know, Dale from Cambridgeshire has just purchased the exact same t-shirt that you're looking at. I, I get that's booking.com-esque, but um, you know, the, the these are all examples of copying from other industries or sites and applying their concept to our site. They solve user problems for their users and their industries, we can do the same for similar user problems. I always argue why we as, as experimenters don't really look at, say, the pharmaceutical industry. They do quite a lot of experimentation, don't they? You know, drug testing, surely they would be the experts. So in terms of operations and practices, I wonder if we can learn a thing or two from them. But guys, I've got about three, four, five slides left. So if you've got any questions, um, now's a good chance to write it out or take notes or, or what have you. But the last C, the dodgy C, that I can really get a C for, is continually iterate. Uh, I've saved this one to the end. But the only way to be creative is to let it evolve. So creativity actually rarely comes to us in a eureka moment, you know, those aha moments of very rare. In fact, one would argue that they don't really exist that they're either kind of preconditioned within the brain or they are you have different stimulus over a period of time at which it makes you think that an aha moment exists really interestingly there's a story about darwin um you know he spoke of natural selection as this aha eureka moment but there's lots of evidence to suggest that darwin had the full theory for natural selection written down in notebooks like many 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 months before he, uh, he um, created his essay, he publicized his essay. Uh, was it in origin or something? Anyways, so yes, continually iter iterating is really important. Let, let, me, let me talk you through this. I think this might be the last slide. Um, but I implore you to reiterate on experiments, to push their creativity and evolve um, of flannels, actually about 40 to 50 percent of all experiments are iterations of one another. So this experiment saw a common user problem. Flannels customers who were not signed into the site, they, they couldn't remember whether they actually even had an account, let alone their password. That was because of the low annual frequency of purchase. This is quite a common common theme of those who tried to log in. You know, 20 percent of them forgot their password. Um, but more importantly, there's X percent who didn't know that they even had an account. When we received this password error, the conversion rate dropped significantly, uh, including across sessions. And again, you'd expect that a little bit. 
but we assume whether users know whether they have an account at this stage, right? So instead of users thinking they don't have an account, try to go through a guest route, only to be told they do have an account, why don't we do the hard work for them and, and tell them, you know what, David? There's some PII there, that's my email address. And um, you know what, David? You do have an account. All right, that's what we did. So we created this. This is a really clean version where we told users whether they had an account or not after they entered their email address. So David M, userconversion.com, enter, yeah, you have an account, enter your password. Or no, you don't have an account. We'll just ship you straight through to guest. I, I get, like, you, I think uh, Magento sites do this, for example. Uh, the result actually was 13% more users went back <laughs> to the previous page. Oops. And um, 4% of users, 4% uh, less, flowed through that, that journey going forward. Um, it might have been the execution, less so the concept, but we got together, we reviewed some session recordings. You know, data obviously can't tell you everything that's going on, and we created this. We created a scenario where instead of assuming whether the users know whether they have an account or not, we, we gave them a series of options. You know, uh, so, you enter your email address, do you have a Flannels account? Yes, no, not sure. What was really interesting is that the not sure was utilized like 10% of the time. 10% of all users uh, actively stated they were not sure whether they have an account. Lo and behold, drove, drove checkout progression uh, by, by 15%, decreased users going back in the journey by 60%, more importantly. And we iterated on that a few times. So, in summary, um, create the conditions to be creative. You know, they can come from the boss, the leader, the manager. They can be a physical environment. But for me, it was the, the conditions, the, the conflict and the, uh, the collaboration that was perhaps most important. Guys, ignore best practice, uh, you know, for the, for the CMOs and the, the e-com managers that, that are on the line. Best practice is, uh, is limiting. Let's put it that way. Not that it doesn't work. You know, I, I advocate there are no such things as a, as a silver bullet, but best practice is limiting. Look outside your industry. Don't accept the status quo. Really challenge what is the purpose of X, Y, or Z. And try not to be generic in our, in our approach to stuff. So I think, um, you know, web address, email address is there if you're interested, but Guys, that was like a 35 minute session on, on creativity. It's something I'm really genuinely passionate about and currently writing about. I'd write a book if I could. If there are any publishers listening, I'd be interested in that. But yeah, um, I don't know if there are any questions. I don't know if I can see the questions. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for an amazing presentation. I was actually taking notes and I, uh, you know, staying true to the uh, the theme of the presentation creativity i really really liked uh, the idea with um, you know that he shared with flannel uh, wherein you showed that you know scrolling um, sorry uh, what was the option uh, that you view uh, that you've viewed 21 out of you know x oh, number yes. of products already right and uh, that was quite innovative because i haven't seen that right and i as a user of an e-commerce website would definitely like to see something like that because you know it ends up in a bit of anxiety it builds up that anxiety when you're not able to get to what you actually you know um, uh, went out to look for but uh, that definitely helps uh, in, in my search and to refine my search and to close the deal even faster so that's that's really creative uh, i'm sure the audience would have found it creative as well uh, that's an amazing idea, I must say. I'm, I'm definitely going, I'm definitely taking this uh, recording to uh, my team and showing it to them uh, to take inspiration from as well. Well, let's, let's all copy it and then it will be best practice and then users won't, um, will ignore it from there on in and then it won't have an impact in about two years. Uh, right, so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the problem, of course. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the early, the early adopters will definitely can gain at least can gain at least marginal value out of it until the time it becomes the new normal, right? And then of course you have to keep uh, refining your, uh, you know, your approach and keep coming up with more creative ideas. 
so that you can always stay ahead with from your uh, from your competition that's perfect so i do see a lot of questions have actually come in uh although i had prepared a few questions from my side as well but i'll give priority to the questions that i that are coming in from the attendees right so okay. the first question is from josh uh, he's asking uh how are you handling these tests across devices that is the a to z fly out is very different mobile uh, on mobile versus desktop yeah well look josh there's there's a couple of like lay think of like an experiment idea as layers you have the user problem you have the concept and then the execution in that instance the user problem was um users are struggling to cognitively associate a product to a category the concept is to create an a to z listing the execution is exactly what you're speaking about there josh right it's the what does it look like on mobile to desktop it is what it is it's what it looks like the concept yeah. is more important than the execution and as as an experimenter we're trying to prove or disprove a hypothesis the hypothesis should be about the concept not about the execution so in this instance an a to z uh actually we did that test so long ago goodness me but uh i think we created something like an iphone scrollable thing you know when you go to your, your conditions say an iphone when you go to your phone and you go to your contacts and you got all the the alphabets down the left the right hand side and you just go to d for decking for example whereas on desktop it's a lot more visible it's within a scrollable div etc cetera, etc cetera. so i would just separate the concept from the execution there right so that actually makes me curious about you know uh, i think this is uh, a question that has been asked you know, several times as well that do you really need to have a separate hypothesis for each of the devices so if a buyer is buying from a laptop versus a mobile versus his you know tablet uh, there does that need to be you know there different hypothesis for each well see i'm gonna i'm gonna say no um, mm -hmm. Again, we just need to think about what is a hypothesis. A hypothesis is, is an assumption that you want to prove or disprove. It's not something that you want to um, prove or disprove by a range or a number or like a binomial metric. It's to say, I believe by creating an A to Z category, it will reduce the anxiety in users trying to find their products, for example. Right. The execution could be a button that says A to Z. It could be a page that's, that is an A to Z page. It could be, I don't know, a 3D augmented reality, VR, super duper thing. It, it's not that it doesn't matter, but for me, a hypothesis about proving or disproving a concept. The, excuse me, the continual iteration bit is about iterating on the execution. I don't know if you guys can still see my screen, but in this example of the Flannels login page, you know the concepts actually remained the same throughout the execution just changed and we could have got it really right here but the execution i assume was was a bag of crap because it didn't have a call to action uh, associated to it i know you're all thinking that don't worry um so yeah it's in, in my mind it's not about having a, a separate hypothesis for uh, every device it's about having a hypothesis that proves the concepts and the execution is what you iterate on. Right, right, got it. Uh, it's generally because uh, people are in different uh, environment, in different moods. Uh, you know, when they are uh, uh, when they are on these respective devices, right? Uh, maybe somebody is just taking a break and they are not near the laptop, and they just want to, you know, quickly swipe through the the list of you know yeah. items that they want to purchase. Right, so they're just candidly looking, they're just casually looking. And so, you know, uh, maybe tweaking a few things, maybe some sort of personalization there on the mobile device uh, versus laptop could help. But again, that's something that you have to test, right? And you have to be, you have to be creative, uh, follow the five C's that uh, David just mentioned. That I made up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, cool. So this, quickly taking the second question, uh, it's from Jenny Moore. Uh, so the question is, what's your opinion on starting over and redesigning a website from the ground up rather than iterating? Oh, Jenny, how long do we have? 
there are like there are too many factors at play, right? There's there's stakeholders, uh, macro factors, more environment. There's the boss that turns around and says we're redesigning it tomorrow. Uh, I don't think there's like the perfect way, in my opinion, because I think it's all contextual. But from experience, we've been involved in both both sides. We've been involved in redesigns where we experiment to iterate and then continually evolve the the site for example one of the dangers like that people won't often tell you the practicalities of that will be uh of those of you who don't do server side and you do client side testing or of those of you who do client side testing and you have a dev team that don't implement your experiments often uh you tend to get like this Frankenstein of experiment on top of experiment on top of experiment. So that's like a really good contextual example of what well, if you go down the iteration route, are your devs generally going to take an experiment and implement it live, or is it server side, for example, so you don't have to you don't have to go about doing that. Um, in the instance of redesigning through research or knowledge, I think it's just important to remember. I'm going to get a slap on the wrist for this. But that's that's just like theoretical stuff. Just because a user says they will do something called research suggest X, Y, or Z, it certainly reduces your risk and increases your confidence that X, Y, or Z will work. But an experiment is one of demonstrating practicality, improving concepts through data. Yes, this works, and I can prove that. Um, so I don't really have an answer for you, Jenny, unfortunately. Uh, it is all contextual. Um, feel free if you want, if you want to give us an email or something. You can tell me about your scenario. Maybe you could try to help. But um, yeah, it's contextual. Right. It's very, very contextual. And I think uh, there's a major role to play from the leadership because it's a big exercise, right? Starting over uh, you know, a complete redesign process requires a lot of resources versus just tweaking, uh, you know, or just iterating upon a few things, you know, so definitely, uh, you know, just check if your leadership would be very interested in, you know, starting over versus iterating. So that'll definitely help. So it all depends. That's, that's the unwanted answer, but that's in. Unfortunately, uh, no, that's an answer. Right. Great. Uh, so the next question is from Gabriel. Gabriel was interested in asking the question himself. Uh, let me quickly search Gabriel in the attendee list so that so that I can uh, switch on his mic. Looks like right. So okay. Found you. So Gabriel, I've uh, unmuted you. Right. So you can quickly go ahead and ask your question uh, within a minute. Okay. Hello, guys. How are you? Hello, David. Thank Thanks you, Gabriel, for the the presentation for having my question. So uh, I work with CRO here in, in Brazil, and while we are brainstorming, uh, there are a lot of like tech restrictions that uh, appears while we are brainstorming. And uh, since we usually know the websites very much, very much, uh, uh, usually we I think it's it's bad for the the create creative building solutions to, to have like these restrictions at this part of the creative process and i would like to to know your opinion like do, do you leave this tech part aside when you are discussing the solutions or do you think it's a good thing to have this uh why are you discussing it no <laughs> um can you imagine if someone turned around to disney when they were creating the magic band and said, by the way, you can't do anything on the wrist or technology, the technology doesn't exist. Or someone turned around to Elon Musk and said, by the way, you can't create electric cars, that, that doesn't exist yet. It's like technology will, I say technology, you know, IT implementation, dev, um, it can be restrictive. Uh, you know, that's, I think that's where the collaborative conflict culture uh, conditions come from. You know, it's about being open and really challenging one another. In those scenarios, prove it, Gabriel. Like, I really advocate an MVP, minimum viable product. If you want to create a feature 
that allows users to look at their couch in their living room, for example, create a button that says, uh, look at your couch in your living room live and try and determine the intent of that button. The button doesn't need to do anything. You know, it's a, it's a painted door, it's a false door test. It can just have say, we're really sorry, this feature isn't available yet. So you, you again, we go back to the hypothesis question. You're trying to prove or disprove a concept. Concept in this case is, would users like to see couches in their living room? <laughs> uh, I just I'd assume so. Um, and that button would help you get around those tech issues. It's just, you know, creativity is about solving problems in a effective manner, really. And you, Gabriel, you actually have a problem there. That problem is, I assume, um, your development team can be restrictive. How do you solve that problem creatively, Gabriel? You know. Um, do you get them more involved? Do you get them less involved? Do you get them motivated? Do you push them? Read the, um, I, don't, I don't have it there. Read the Steve Jobs book of how he created this, um, this mentality, I forgot what they called it, where he really pushed his, his uh, designers to create, you know, he called it like the Steve Jobs reality distortion or something. So yeah, try and tackle that problem using stuff that you've learned within this webinar. Perfect. I uh, hope uh, you got the answer, Gabriel. Uh, I have another in interesting question from Spencer. Uh, it's a bit long one. So the question is, how would you suggest uh, speaking with stakeholders that are concerned about best practice uh, when test results don't show positive impact? Maybe promoting further iterations? Uh, in this case, best practice is perceived as perceived by individuals without sophisticated justification of this best practice. Yeah. Uh, so did you, did you get the question? Sort of, yeah. How do you speak to stakeholders about best practice? About best practices, right. It's difficult. Uh, look, like the one thing I would say is that we are, we're in a specific industry, in a specific mm. field. We have a lot of knowledge about this industry in this field. We shouldn't expect stakeholders to hold the same amount of knowledge that we hold about this field, okay? Just in the way that if we speak to a finance director or a CFO, we wouldn't, you know, they shouldn't expect us to know everything about how, how they operate or how spreadsheets or P&Ls work. So empathy is really important here. It's not we're right and you're wrong at all. You know, it's where arrogance sets in. It's about empathy and authenticity and transparency and really understanding the stakeholder that you're speaking to. So get to know them. It's quite a fluffy answer, Spencer, I'm sorry, but get to know them and understand them and where they're coming from. Often people will tell you some quite malicious things like, oh, just do it and hide their IP. We've done that before. Uh, or, or just do it and um, show them that it's wrong and manipulate the results or whatever it might be. My, my answer is probably a little bit more emotional than that. Um, it probably doesn't answer your question, but try to understand where they're coming from. And it's a slow education. It's not an arrogant hand in the fist education. Right. Indeed, it is. Uh, you know, there's no direct answer to this. Uh, right. And uh, that's all. Uh, I mean, it's it's where the concept of hypo you know, comes into the picture, right? And uh, they're definitely uh, trying to avoid all kind of risks, right? And uh, best practices actually help you do that, to avoid all kind of risks because, hey, there's there's a bunch of, you know, other businesses who have uh, tested this out, who have tried this out. So you already know what the outcome could be. You have that idea, right? So it becomes easy to follow best practices rather than to, you know, try out and come up with something really bold and something very, very new and innovative. So I think yeah. the value is definitely in being innovative. That's where the competitive advantage lies as well. Don't you think? Yeah, Spencer, you know, the um, the graph that I showed earlier, the anxiety, uh, usability, anxiety, motivation, what you find is that a lot of best practice are ridden uh, with usability issues. And sometimes that graph alone really resonates with people. So just to, just a reminder, a usability implementation is something that makes 
um, makes an action easier. It facilitates an action that's already in existence. And anxiety is, is creating something that will prevent an action and motivation is something that will persuade an action. And often what you'll find is that user problems, i.e. the why, um, that anxiety and motivation classifications are the only way to attack a why or address a why. They're the only solutions for a why. A usability-based problem is something that will just facilitate something that already exists. So some, when you describe that like that, I, I've been in like a pitch or two before, and sometimes it just clicks and it really resonates with them. But the best way for me is to to just understand like where they're coming from, what that means, and how to connect with them. Right, right. Uh, hope that uh, gives you some idea, Spencer. Great. So I think we are nearing the 60-minute mark, and I have just one more question. Uh, right. And uh, I saw one other person as well. Uh, you know, curious about this so uh, if you can just you know share two or three books that uh, you would recommend first from the experimentation uh, for an experimentation professional and then you know any 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 other book that you would that you are currently reading or like to read yeah let's do it let's do it live um <laughs> sure so, there you go stefan tompe oh, works great book fairly recent came out this year um really good as you can see the pay pages are fairly new so i haven't really read much of it but the guy's um guy knows his stuff interestingly like the first chapter talks about culture and why experimentation's important to businesses uh i don't have the next one that i'm going to recommend but it's a disney one i'm sorry um ed catmull wrote a book called creativity inc Ed Catmull is like the ops director of Pixar, and he talks about, well, creativity, but his road to Pixar and what, um, how they tell stories. And to that note, mm -hmm. the book that I'm reading at the moment is um, Pixar Storytelling. I, I'm about like two pages in. It's been a rough couple of nights. Um, but yeah, it's for me, I really love, I love stories. I love love drawing and sketching. Uh, I love trying to just create new ways to um, really address user problems. You know, I'm just really I'm not on any revolution here. I just love to to just push the boundaries a little bit. Right. I've quickly taken a note of that book because I haven't heard of that book before, but it sounds good. And uh, uh, by Dean, sorry, uh, who's author again? Oh, Dean Moshevitz. I think he. I think he actually worked. Uh, did you do? I think he worked for Pixar. Right, because uh, I think uh, a few months back I came across this infographic uh, about how Pixar. Uh, you know, on the same topic of Pixar storytelling, and there were around fourteen or eighteen points, I believe, maybe more, uh, about uh, you know how to portray the uh, character, how to. Uh, how to they tell the story to... that really encapsulates, yeah. you know, how just captures everyone's interest. So that's that's really good, and I would be definitely interested in reading this book. We'll see if it if they deliver it uh, in India as well. Uh, sure but yeah, that's that's great, and uh, uh, it's time to close this webinar uh, again. Thank you so much, David, for your effort and you know sh taking out the time to share the knowledge. Uh, amazing presentation, uh, you know, with our audience today. That's really amazing. See you later. Great. So yeah, guys, before I click on the close button, I just wanted to let you know, right? So uh, we'll be popping, uh, I mean, there'll be a survey popping up just once this webinar is closed. So do fill that up. It will definitely help us in improving our future presentation. It will definitely, you know, uh, help David also understanding how you felt about this presentation. So I'll be passing on this feedback to uh, David as well, right? And of course, if you have any further questions for you, for David or beat me, you know, just feel free to connect with David uh, on his email address that he just shared it with you a while back, or just connect with him on LinkedIn. He's super active there, uh, you know. And if you want to connect with me as well, just you know, find me uh, on LinkedIn. Just type in Vipul Pansal, right? So yeah, with that, have a good day and uh, stay safe and keep washing your hands regularly. Goodbye. Bye.